Hey, this is Kevin Winston with Digital LA. We are very excited to have William Winkler, who has dubbed uh, multiple Ultraman movies from the J Japanese versions to English. Uh, you all know him and love him, and uh, he actually was the voice of Ultraman X as well. So, uh, William, can I call you Bill? Yes, you can call me Bill. All right. Go nice, to, nice to meet you guys. Nice awesome. to meet Thanks you, Kevin. So much. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And You're welcome. Uh, talk about Ultraman and uh, the work you did. Uh, yes. Deb, how many films did you dub? Uh, I wrote, produced, and directed six Ultraman feature films that were wow. Japanese uh, pictures. Uh, uh, they were all theatrical feature films, except one was a uh, television uh, project, te television feature that they later turned into like a little mini series. But uh, Ultraman Ginga S, the movie, which was based on the television series, and then uh, Ultra Fight Victory, which was the television uh, project, and the 50th anniversary film of Ultraman, Ultraman X, the movie, based on the Ultraman X series, and then the uh, trilogy, uh, the Warner Brothers Japan movie, Mega Monster Battle, Ultra Galaxy. That was a big budget Japanese film and uh, Warner Brothers Japan was part of that. And then its sequel, uh, Ultraman uh, Zero, The Revenge of Belial. That was a terrific one. And then the final in the, that trilogy, uh, Ultraman Saga. And those were uh, six features that, that we had done. Two of the pictures, uh, Ultraman Ginga S the movie and Ultraman X the movie in 2017 were uh, shown theatrically throughout the US and Canada in about 50, uh, 40 some 50 uh, theaters, cities around the country. And it was kind of a successful uh, limited screening of those pictures. And now Mill Creek Entertainment is distributing uh, Ultraman X the movie on Blu-ray, and they have it streaming on their uh, their own streaming site called Movie Spree. So that's that's the short answer to so you. You are very well versed and familiar with the world of Ultraman. So, oh <laughs> yes, yes. I'll always say yes. So, we were we were going to do a show back in the eighties. You know, um, I, I, I've been I've been doing anime since nineteen eighty. 85 wow. is a very young producer at the time you know contrary to my youthful looks you see <laughs> but I I did I was I was uh, before Funimation and before all that I I was working in the the analog days of anime dubbing with Tekka Man the Space Knight and uh, a lot of other shows and just continued to work through the years uh writing producing directing dubbing different shows for most of, a lot of different studios in japan um most of the anime companies most of the uh production companies and such but uh yeah we were going to do uh, ultraman 80 uh an english version of that prior to power rangers we i had an idea where if we had we would have Adam West, who was known as Batman from the Batman yeah, television that's series. That's and Adam was going to play this sort of host. Um, there was a space station and he'd be in the space station and he would uh, report when there'd be alien creatures attacking Earth. And they had a group called UGM, Utility Government Members. It was kind of like the Science Patrol. And so he would uh, report into to the headquarters in Japan and say, oh, we just have this you know, creature attacking, blah, blah, blah. And then it would go into the whole show. It would never have been as dramatically changed as what Hayam Saban did with Power Rangers or Super Sentai, you know. But it was very funny. We, to make a long story short, we didn't do it, but we were going to, we were going to do it. And then years later, I was at NBC at, the, at an airing of The Tonight Show and Adam was there and then Adam told me, he says, Billy, because this was after Power Rangers had aired and it was a big giant success. And he said, Billy, they stole your Power Rangers idea. Because we were going to do that with that Ultraman thing. And I said, well, Adam, you know, it's, it's, that's Hollywood, you know. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> so, but it's funny, years later, um, 
Jun Yokoyama was the head of international sales at Subarai. He's no longer with Subarai, but he'd have been there for 30 years, made them a, a lot of money. And uh, he came to me and, and, and wanted me to do these productions. He basically said the company was going to start uh, English dubbing some of their features, some of the high-end features. The actually, the ones we did were really the, the, the major big budget films that they'd made in Japan and uh, said, we'd like you to do it. And I was in Japan at the time. I, uh, the Japanese government flew me over to Japan because they knew about my work and I had a translator and they flew me first class airfare and the hotels all day. Nice. Yes. So uh, then uh, he bought me dinner and said, listen, this is what, what our plan is and we want to do this and this and this. And I said, great. So that's how it started. Uh, a few years back, you know? Very cool. Just to bring everybody up to speed, what exactly does a dubber do? Well, it, it's, it's, dubbing is sort of a, a lost art, I believe. And I think it has more in common with music composition. And uh, what I try to do is create an illusion that like with Ultraman, I was with the feature films we did with Ultraman, I was trying to create an illusion that these were Japanese American actors living and working in Hollywood, speaking their native tongue of American English. I didn't want you to think it was dubbed. And I had spent so many years doing it and there's so many tricks of what I do to get the lip sync right and the emotions of the characters and the casts that we had. Uh, my scripts are very detailed. Um, it's it, anything that comes out of the mouth is what uh, has to be written down because it, it, it a good dubbing job, it all, ha it all has to do with uh, the script. If that script has problems, you're dead. There's no fixing that problem. And so uh, I stay true to the Japanese material. We never edited anything. Uh, around the time we did all these Ultraman films, um, you know, we didn't have to worry about the things I had to worry about in the 80s when we would syndicate shows for television and there was action for children's television and the pressure groups and you couldn't have the violence and you had to rewrite things and alien creatures who would die, you'd say, well, you'd, you'd call them androids or whatever, and that they were luckily deactivated, or there'd be a ship exploding, and you'd say, you'd have a narrator say something like, well, luckily they were able to escape in the, you know, the escape <laughs> ship or something. <laughs> yeah, but I never had to do any of that anymore because this was a whole different market. It was not going to go, those 1980s days of having to sanitize everything were gone. But, um, Basically, it, it, it is the toughest type of production to do, dubbing, and it's not looping, and it has more in common with music composition, and you have to have an ear for the Japanese language, you have to know the material, um, and it's, there's so many things that go on with the timing, and the lip sync, and the structure of Japanese um, sentences. And just without going into woo-woo stuff, the voice actors, the Hollywood voice actors have to really channel those characters. Mm -hmm. And they have to think the thoughts of those characters and feel the emotions of those characters because, because acting is 80% emotion. And that's how you really get a good dub. I mean, it, gets, it goes down to like the laughter. What type of laughter, do we, I mean, if a character's laughing in a scene, how many laughs were there, you know? And the proximity of people. If I'm talking to somebody far away, I'll be, you know, yelling. But if you're right next to me, who's that? Who's that person over there? What were they? Doing? You know, all these little subtle things. In anime dubbing, it's a little bit less because um, you're dealing with a flap. Okay, so it, you have a little more wiggle room. It's a cartoon, basically. But with live action, for you know, it is infinitely harder. And some of those Ultraman movies were dialogue heavy. I mean, the, the Saga movie especially was just endless, endless, endless dialogue. And characters talking over each other. Get right. a room of people talk, and then you've got to break it down by scene by scene. It, it was, I don't think people truly appreciate the tremendous work that goes into doing something like this. That's and it is- it, it, having this conversation. I want everyone to appreciate yeah. what a dubber does. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's that's amazing. So um, with 
with with live action dubbing, like everyone can see the exact lip movements that the characters are making. So if you don't match those up yep. enough, people will be like, "Wait a second. So, uh, right. yeah, right. And it and it's also also um, sometimes a sentence in Japanese. There'll be in order to get a thought across, it'll take three sentences in Japanese, but it might only be one sentence in English, or mm -hmm. vice versa. So in that case. You have to do creative writing. You have to stay within the context, context of the piece. You have to forward the story. You have to you know, do things that, that work within what the character would normally say, but you're having creative license to create. It's creative writing. Right. Because I have to fill space. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Humor is also a big problem. Sometimes a joke that's funny in Japanese, it's not funny in English because there's something goes wrong in the translation. Right. So in those situations, you know, you'd have a typical ha ha ending or something like that. And it's not funny. So in those cases, I had a creative license to inject a little American humor into it. And then it would make the joke funny. And then the laughter made sense. The scene would make sense. Right. But most importantly, Subaraya, what JJ wanted was um, children, the key demographic for a lot of these movies, it was basically kids, boys, ages six, seven, eight years old. I mean, they, they, were, they were kids' movies, basically. Family movies, but also kids. And so it had to be dubbed. Now, for subtitling, teenagers, fans, they watch subtitled versions of, of things that's great um you know art house movie theaters run subtitled content netflix will run nighttime stuff that's subtitled but when you're when you're dealing with children's programming kids do not read subtitles they never have they never will it's you know there's a huge history of why that doesn't work so it has to be dubbed and so i always tried to reach the widest audience possible with my English dubs. You know, I, I made Hollywood quality, Disney type dubs that were authentic to the Japanese material that would appeal to, you know, the 330 million Americans. And, right, right. And that's what, I mean, like if you see Ultraman X, the movie, that is exactly what I try to do. There's certain companies who will do kind of more fan-based dubs where they're very literal translations and it's, it, it comes across as weird and artificial or there's kind of fortune cookie dialogue. And that, I never did those type of things. I can do them. By the way, we, we do, when we do a subtitled version, it's exactly what the Japanese are saying. Right. But um, for, for, for these type of dubs, especially something this iconic and famous, we, we just try to make it to appeal to the widest audience possible. And in, you know, when we had the limited theatrical screenings, the, re the reactions like at the Chicago Music Box Theater and places were phenomenal. I mean, Twitter was going all over the place and the social media and so it worked. The uh, nostalgic adults were watching them with their children and then there were teenagers there and such. So it was, um, you know, it, it, it's worked, you know. Amazing. Probably a reason why I've been doing this for 30 something years, you know. Exactly. Right. Right. Who is your favorite character to uh, dub? My favorite character? Of Ultraman or any of the anime? Of, of, of Ultraman. Of Ultraman. Well, I think that playing the voice of Ultraman X, <laughs> yes, I did kind of a Gary Owens type of voice there, you know. And right. Right. He was, he had funny was lines. I mean, at, the end, at the end, he had lines, you know, our mission is Ultraman, is to maintain balance to the universe. You know, this, this type of a thing. And he had right. a weapon, he had a weapon, he used to go like this, you know, he'd make an right. X with his hands. And his weapon was the Xanadium beam. So he'd go, Xanadium beam! You know, he'd go, <laughs> ba 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 ba. As I said earlier, Whenever the Japanese superhero is going to use a weapon, he will announce the weapon, to, you know, what he's doing to the villain. And I would never do that because you're giving, you know, you're giving the villain a little clue as to what you're doing. <laughs> he can come up with the Xanadium beam shield or something, you know, but. Right. <laughs> a little, anyway. little, little. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Those were fun characters. And we had great voice actor continuity. I had voice actors in Hollywood 
By the way, they were all the same ages as the characters that you see in the films, oh, right. pretty much. So in other words, it's a weird thing. If you saw the American cast and then you saw the, the Japanese cast, they are like mirror images of each other. I mean, they looked like the people, kind of, you know, because when, you, when you're dubbing, you want to get a voice. It's like fitting a key in a lock, and you want to make sure that that character, do I believe that that voice is coming out of that face? Right. And the, the voice actors that we used were uh, perfect matches, I think. And, and they looked like the guys and it, it, was, it was very, uh, very uncanny to see. But uh, we had voice actor continuity. So in other words, there were characters throughout those six movies, there were characters that would re reoccur. And I had the same Holly, working Hollywood voice actors playing re those roles over and over. Like, you know, um, you know, Daniel Van Thomas played Ultraman Zero, and he was Ultraman Zero in all of the movies whenever Zero appeared, and the same thing for Ginga, and the same thing for, uh, you know, Sho, who was uh, Ultraman Victory. I saw your shirt. You have Ultraman Zero yes, on your shirt right next to uh, Ultra uh, Seven. This is one of the eight uh, unique low shirts that just came out, so... Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, he was the, he was Ultra Seven. Uh, uh, Ultraman Zero was Ultraman Seven's son. Right. Right. Uh, the fact that Ultraman does has wears a mask uh, does that make that big easier? Um. Well, it it yes. If 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 a character doesn't have lips moving, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Right. I uh, one of the easiest things I I did a I did something that was uh, kind of associated with Hello Kitty and the funny thing about it is that those characters don't have mouths. At That's all. right. Hello Kitty is not, <laughs> you know, Kitty but, not have mouths. But anyway, but 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 um remember in Ultraman usually um by the time you get to the point where the human character has to transform into the hero to fight. You've already had a good majority of the movie where the pe human beings are talking. Right. So it, it was not, you still had a hell of a job working to try to dub those type of, you know, characters. But it is true, you know, sometimes there were cases with uh, anime where if there's a mask on, oh, then I'm not locked into that time frame. Right. So I can I can create a little bit more with the writing, you know. Right, right. It allows you to. I, I can I can I can like, I can embellish a little more with the carrot. I can fix certain things. Right. You know, that's another thing. Sometimes you know, there's always an Ed Wood moment <laughs> in a lot of these things, and I don't mean that in a in a mean way, but you can fix a little pothole <laughs> in a story or a little whatever through a narration or through dialogue, you know. So we had um, one of the things that was a character, Ultraman King. Yeah, Ultraman King, the, the one who's purple with the, um, the late Robert Axelrod, who was the voice of Lord Zed in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was the voice of Ultraman King. Wow. In, in, in Mega Monster Battle Ultra Galaxy. And he had a beautiful speech at the end of the movie. And uh, he was great. That was one of Robert Axelrod's last uh, movie roles, I think, you know. Very cool. What are some of your favorite uh, catchphrases or sayings that you were able to do? I think you gave us a little sneak preview of some. Uh, what, beam beam. What, uh, catchphrases. Well, I can't, I think other than his, I think other than his weapon call. I, I, I can't remember too many, um, I can't remember too many other catchphrases of, of uh, the movies that I had done, you know. Right. Um, we, by the way, we used regular American accents and such. I mean, just we didn't do sort of a, back in the 1960s, uh, they had to use, when they dubbed the original Ultraman in 66, they had to use these kind of somewhat Asian-ish type or Asian voices where it would be like English is, is kind of a second language and there would be a bit of an accent. So they did that. We, of course, didn't do any of that uh, in any of our dubs. But it, as a funny coincidence, 
as I told you, because I've been doing this for so long, I have one foot in the analog world and one foot in the dis digital world. But I knew Peter Fernandez, who was the voice of Speed Racer, and he did voices in the original 66 Ultraman movie. And Corrine Orr, who was the voice of Trixie in Speed Racer, also did voices oh, cool. at Tetra. Uh, she's like my aunt. She's like family. I, you know, I'm on the East Coast, and I see her often. And she, I think she's one of the last remaining voice actors from the original Ultraman uh, 66 dub, you know. They did those at Titra. Titra was a, was a big New York, you know, dubbing house. And they did like Clint Eastwood movies like The Good, The Bad, The Ugly and, and Fistful of Dollars and all these, you know, Fellini movies and all that. But they also did the Japanese stuff and Kareem did a lot of Godzilla movies. But they did Ultraman and I remember... The guy who did vo the English voice of Hayata was an actor, a radio actor named Earl Hammond. But Earl Hammond's real name was Earl Hamburger. And <laughs> he, he always, yeah, that, like McDonald's hamburger. And um, they all got along great dubbing at, at Tetra. And, you know, you'd, they'd be smoking in the, in the dubbing booths and there'd be curtains and all that in Man Midtown Manhattan, basically. And they all knew each other. And, and, it was very funny. Karina told me some funny stories about um, about uh, Earl, where she would be in an elevator with Earl, and they'd be going down to the lobby, you know, after dubbing or something, and there might be some other people waiting, and the doors open, and she and Earl would walk out, and he'd say something like, "You want twenty five dollars just for that? Well, forget it. I'm not gonna, you know." <laughs> <laughs> it was a, he was a naughty, he had a naughty sense of humor, you know? Right, right. But um, they thought it was kind of funny, to be honest. I remember Kareen telling me that they dubbed an episode where there was a monster that if you held a ball and you dreamt something up, it could become that thing. Huh. It, I don't know if you remember what that one, there was a sh episode huh. of Ultraman where, where they had this, this, this thing that, you know, if you thought of a birthday cake or you thought of whatever, it would become that. And this man thought of a monster and it turned into this giant monster that Ultraman had to fight. And the, the suit had little, was like a monster thing, but it had like these odd little feet, like weird shoes or something. And they couldn't, the dubbers at Tetra, you know, Corrine and Earl Hammond and, and Peter Fernandez, they could not stop laughing. <laughs> and how funny it was. It was like, oh my God, look at this monster. And he's got these little <laughs> shoes. <laughs> you know, she's uh, shoes. Anyway, um, but. Uh, so when, you're, when you're dubbing with the. Uh, but they used to, the way they used to dub, you know, they'd say like, oh, Hayata, it is so very nice to see you. Oh, there's the monster there, the Bolton Siege. You know, it was that type of a thing, you know. And, right. Uh, oh, yes, Fuji, you know. But. Um, we didn't have to do any of that stuff because it was a, a totally different. Uh, right, totally, I guess, American. I used to see the original Ultraman as a kid in the 70s. You know, I'd go to school, come home from school, do my homework, milk and cookies, and then in syndicated television, you'd see it. And it was like watching an original, like a mini Godzilla movie every day, Monday through Friday. Right. Remember, there's no phones, no cable TV, <laughs> none of this stuff. You this only was... had the three channels, and then you had syndicated shows, and that was it. But what's interesting is that you could get a gigantic, enormous audience. When I did my early anime in the 80s, the audience for Tekaman was bigger than tonight's ABC, NBC audience figures. Wow. You understand that? that yeah. it, it's a totally different ballgame. The audience now is splintered into a million little pieces, and there's so much content, and there's so many... It just boggles my mind to see how the whole thing has changed, you know? Yeah, it's been um, amazing. Very it, digital. It is, yeah, it is. But back in the days of Ultraman, it was a mainstream kids show. Oh, sure, and, a lot of people and, just- and Little boys, I'm, I'm 55. So guys my age knew Ultraman. Um, of course, Speed Racer was the ultimate, you know? Right show that was the right. one that had it but these were big mainstream uh shows and i can't begin to emphasize how important it was if you were a, a successful kid show in syndicated television in the 70s yeah. you had you had an enormous audience you know
right. When you're uh, when the cast is is dubbing, uh, are they typically in separate rooms doing it all separately, or are they ever together in the same room to get this camaraderie as they're watching the video? How how does that work? Well, you know. Uh, we had good budgets on these things, but they were not gigantic, enormous budgets. And uh -huh. so we did it the modern way, the way Disney does it is basically one voice actor at a time would come in and do the recordings. And it went like clockwork, you know. The other thing too was that my voice actors always got the scripts ahead of time so they could study and learn. And I would give them, I would send them links to the videos, uh, watermarked videos of what they were going to dub to. So they were beautifully prepared. They right. knew when they went into the studio, ah, this is what the show is. This is what's going on. This is what I have to do. They'd have the script there. And so it, it, there were no unpleasant surprises or anything like that. You know, right. I mean, I, I, a lot of voice actors who work for other companies said, my God, I can't believe when I come in, because it's like, they come in, they do the job, they go, they get their check right then and there. <laughs> you know, um, I, I guess I guess not a lot of companies did that, you know. Right, so. right. When, uh, would you be able to direct them to say something in a slightly different way or a different intonation or more emotion or more this or more that? Oh, of course, yes. Yes, I, 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 they, I have to constantly uh, tweak what they're doing. Some right. actors, I, 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 when they, like I said, when, they, when the characters are in the superhero modes, they start going over the top. Right. You know, there's a couple actors I have to bring down <laughs> a little bit because they're a little bit too... <laughs> Larry Butler did... did uh, I use some of the same voice actors over and over. People I've worked with for you know, 20 some years, you know, and, and, and um, you know, I remember having David Gerald uh, from Star Trek uh, doing some voices for me. And uh -huh. I remember he would be, he came in sometimes and he would read a line and he'd see the line. Cause, cause you know, when, when we dub, we have the line on the screen at the bottom. Right. He, we go line by line by line. And um, he one time said, he read the line. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I said, that's what he's saying. I can't change it. <laughs> Just play it, David. And he would do it. Right. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes there, like I said, there's, there's often a, a little bit of an Ed Wood moment, you know? Right. Right. Excellent. Mm. Uh, so what, uh, what are you most excited about, about uh, this resurgence in Ultraman that's happening now with the uh, release of the Marvel comic? Well, I think it's wonderful. I, I, I wish Subaraya the, the best of uh, success with it. Um, I saw uh, the, the artwork on one of the covers, I think that's what I saw, was um, uh, Alex Ross, right? He did the cover. Yeah, Alex Ross is a wonderful uh, artist, and he oh, does yeah. these, these um, oil paintings that are very right. realistic, you know, and right. that's, that kind of is, it, it goes back to kind of a classic type of art that uh, I was just at the Frazetta Museum in Pennsylvania recently, and you just look at, you know, Frazetta's art, and it's just incredible, and, and Alex Ross is, is like that, you know, yeah. and I think he's a fan of Japanese material, because I know he did, he did some anime uh, versions as well. Right. Uh, good lighting, just right. You could have an Alex Ross pose or something like that. Alex Ross, yes, <laughs> yes, of, of Ultraman X. I will say too, I, I, I'm currently working with uh, my good friend and my my a business partner, of mine in Japan, is uh, Takeshi Yagi, and Takeshi Yagi was the director and producer of a lot of Ultraman shows in the 90s. He did Ultraman Max, Ultraman Mebius, Ultraman Nexus, Ultraman uh, Ultra 7X, um, and the uh, new Ultra, the remake of Ultra Q. But of course his big movie was uh, Superior Ultraman 8 Brothers. And that movie was the biggest box office moneymaker in Japan. So we've gotten together, we're developing a couple projects. We've got several in development now we've been writing. And the concept is we're doing these things where he is going to direct them mm -hmm. and we're co-writing them. So it's, 
it's going to be kind of a hybrid productions. They'll look like classic Showa era tokusatsu material, but with some American elements. And it, it kind of came about that we felt that sometimes Japanese properties are brought to America and remade as Hollywood movies, but they're missing something. What they're missing is the Japanese director who knows how to make Showa era tokusatsu. And that's where, that's the benefit that we have. But he, uh, uh, Takeshi Yagi is also doing some promotional things in Japan for this celebration for the Ultraman Day and everything. And his uh, Ultraman Max is being re, uh, re-released now uh, on the Subaraya YouTube channel. So uh, he's all excited about that. And, and uh, that's an excellent show uh, right. yeah, for those who haven't seen Ultraman Max. By the yeah. way, the English, the English version of the Subaraya channel was originally... Um, something that I had convinced uh, Junio Kuyama to do, and ultimately they did do it, the English version one, because I, I said, Subaraya must have had some of, you know, they, they've got to start doing that. Yeah. So they, right. so they ultimately did it. And, uh, oh, the running time, what's interesting too is that Junio Kuyama was telling me that, you know, when we had Ultraman uh, Ginga S, the movie, it, the running time was just short of uh, 60 something minutes, you know, because again, these are kids movies that were kind of in that. The, the, the Warner Brothers Japan movie was longer. That was around 90 minutes. So was Ultraman Zero and so was Saga. But the Ginga movie was more of a, a, a shorter length. And I said, you got to, you know, if you, if you want to really make this successful, you've got to raise the running, uh, you know, bring the running time up to at least around 70 minutes, you know, at least, you know, like the old Disney features. So um, they agreed to do that and the director did it. So that's why Ultraman X had had a longer running time than uh, Ginga did. Gotcha, so, makes sense. Yeah. So where can people find out uh, more about your next projects? Uh, are you on Instagram, Facebook, how, Twitter, what do you? You know what's funny? I, I, I tend to, there are people who do the publicity for when we have things that we release. I'm not such, I'm not always on those, you know, social media things, you know, okay. I, 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 I will do the, um, I will actually make the content and then there's people and teams who will well, right. do all that, yeah, but I'll stay tuned. You'll, if the fans will find out about it and, and uh, <laughs> Awesome, and, Bill. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Everyone go. You're welcome. <laughs> All of Bill's, all of Bill's projects. You can IMDb them if you if you missed yes. them the time that he did, and and watch all of his stuff as we are celebrating uh, Ultraman and uh, his, his his basically the celebration we're having now and the uh, the arrival of Ultraman in Marvel Comics. So thank you so much, Bill, for hanging out with us. You're today. welcome. Happy Ultraman Day. Happy Ultraman. Day. Can you give us a uh, a goodbye Ultraman something? A goodbye Ultraman something. Uh, well, felt farewell from Ultraman X. How's that? Is that awesome. Oh, awesome. Sore de wa mata. There we go. There you know, we that, go. That's, that means I'll see you later in Japanese. Sore de wa mata. Sayonara. Awesome. Thank you so much. Farewell. Well.